Okay. Because not everybody has a booming voice like Jamie Raskin. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so we're going to have, and I want to say I was really uh, thrilled with the all-star panel that we got to speak at the um, symposium today. Uh, these are three uh, really famous uh, Washington psychiatrists, uh, really nationally and internationally famous. Pick up the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, not, not just renowned, but really renowned in this area. So our first speaker, uh, Justin Frank, is a psychiatrist. He's, the clinical, he's a clinical professor of psychiatry at George Washington University Medical Center, but he's also, you may know him as the author of the series of presidential psychobiographies that all have end up on the couch. So uh, we got, uh, how many people do we have on the couch? So far, two. Bush and, uh, and Obama. And you'll be delighted to hear that the third one is going to be Trump on the couch. Yes. So, <laughs> we cannot wait. <laughs> All right. So with, with that uh, introduction, here is uh, Dr. Frank. Hi. Um, this will be 10 minutes maximum. And uh, I said to somebody that, is this OK? Yeah. For people raising their hands. I assume they, they don't want to leave. Are we okay now? Uh, this will be about 10 minutes, and uh, as is typically the case, uh, at least personally for me, in a conference like this, uh, prepared remarks become uh, quickly unprepared. Uh, so I want to just speak a few, a few thoughts that are somewhat spontaneous based on today and based on what's going on. Um, first of all, uh, but some things are written down. One of them is that on August 19th, uh, David Moranis, who you probably know or know of, the historian, made a comment which was that he felt that all ex-presidents should in unison tell Donald Trump to resign. Yes. I don't know if you remember that. So in terms of the duty to warn, it is our duty to warn, and that's what this meeting is about. Um, but it's also our duty to think about uh, how we got here and to think about who we're warning and what we're warning about. So when I was discussing earlier with John Zinner about what we would talk about, I said I would talk about Trump and his uh, uh, proclivity for projection and his uh, sadism. And I still will talk about those, but I want to say a couple of things first, which is that when we really need to address Jamie Raskin's comments, which are very important. And my first question I would have asked him had, we, had he been here would have been, what exactly are the duties of the president? He said that the duties of the president are to carry out the laws uh, from the Congress. That's the executive duties. Is that it? They just that means rubber stamping whatever Congress says or else vetoing it? I don't think so. And so I was going to ask him, what about the duty to think? <laughs> because one of the things that's very important about Donald Trump is that for many years, probably since he was very, very little, he hated thinking and was actually attracted to action and attracted to non-thought. So he's very interested in action, in non-thinking, and because of that, he became uh, against learning. He really defied what uh, some of us are familiar with the word, the epistemophilic instinct, the love of learning. He never had it. And I think that it's very important to remember that. As an aside, it's also important to remember that this is a cycle in American history. It's not just Donald Trump. We had this with Reagan. We've had this before in the 30s. We had this with the Know Nothing Party in, uh, at the turn of the century, of the last century. So we've had a history of attacks on the epistemophilic instinct uh, in cycles, and every generation has had to cope with people who don't want to know, don't want to think, want to, turn to, want to turn a blind eye to what's going on. I think it's very important to remember that for perspective, and at the same time, it will help inform us of some of the most important questions that I think we're not yet addressed here, which is, what do we do about this? I mean, it's very important to deal with uh, the 25th Amendment and all that. It's very important to be here because we have a group of people 
that helps us realize that we're not alone. And that one of the things that's very important is, uh, I remember when I wrote Bush on the Couch, uh, my editor said, aren't you just preaching to the choir? And I said, you know, in a way I am, but they don't know they're a choir. And I think that's been true here, although a little less so, because a lot of people are in touch with their feelings about Donald Trump and about his danger. So one of the things that I do as a psychoanalyst is I'm certainly interested in how people got to be the way they are. One of the comments in the film was about the fact that he's a wounded person, and people were talking about narcissism and wounds and uh, feeling bad. Well, the question is, who gave him the wounds? What, that's the question for me. Well, who is the wounder here? Well, I maintain that the wounder is probably his father, but what's important is that the wounder becomes internalized. So he has an inner wounder. He has an inner tyrant. He doesn't just have a wounded self. He has an internal tyrant that says to his wounded self, Self, I can help you. I can make you feel less wounded and more whole and more connected. So you don't have to feel so bad. And now together we can fight against our siblings, our parents, our teachers, and whoever else gets in our way. And after his brother died in 1981, when Donald was 35, that was enough. He then could take over the family and become like the firstborn, because he suddenly was the firstborn, at least the first son. So from a wounded man, he became a wounder. And one of the things that happens with wounders is they are, have a proclivity to totalitarian ways of thinking, and absolute ways of thinking. So what they do is their perception of reality, since it's not based on um, knowledge or learning, it's based on perception and based on reaction and based on, uh, sometimes on projection. And projection is, as you know, the pot calling the kettle black. It's the projection is when you accuse somebody else of doing what you do. And there have been so many examples of this with Trump when he talks about fake news and then somebody else says, well, he uses fake identifications when he called up news media and, and pretended to be John Barron or somebody else. By the way, he named his son Barron, and uh, his middle name is John. Um, so, whatever that means, but we'll figure that out in the book. Um, but basically, uh, this, is a, this is a serious problem, because a person who has, he is both the wounded and the wounder, and that's what we're dealing with. So I think it's really important to bear that in mind. And when a wounder feels wounded, he wants to wound more. And I think that that puts us in the position, and I was interviewed about a year ago about him, I guess it was not less than a year ago, because it was right before he was inaugurated. But after he was elected, I was interviewed on a, a TV thing, and, and I said that one of the things that's gonna happen, and the interviewer said, you make it sound like he's gonna be like one of those French you know, child kings. And I said, well, actually, what's happened is that if you're a wounder and a wounded, you're going to have an internal conflict between yourself and your parents, especially if your parents are seen as the cruel ones. So what happened is that that has now become externalized. We have to be his parents because he is continuing his fight, and we are now put in the position of having to set limits like you do on an inpatient ward or of having to be his parents. And he is continuing to be the wild, angry, uncontrolled, dangerous, injured boy who happens to have nuclear weapons, which makes it very dangerous. But one of the things that children like that can do, especially early in their life, is they specialize in making their patients anxious. Patients, that's a good slip. Making their parents anxious. I'll have to deal with that later. <laughs> they uh, specialize in making their parents I'm going to lie down, John, and talk later. Um, he, he makes, uh, the, these kind of people make their parents very anxious. And they transfer their anxiety to the adults in the room. And they're expecting all of us to be the adults, not just General Kelly and uh, the others. And I think because he's repeating this pattern, it's a very dangerous pattern. And yet, we have to do something active because there is no ability to change him. Uh, that's just a given.
And the people who thought he would change are, we're living in a world of denial, which Eric Fromm mentioned and other people have mentioned in the, in the talk. So what I want to say finally is that with his base, they also can't be changed. We have as much chance of convincing them as we do of convincing him. He can't listen because he won't listen. He's not capable of it because it's either too dangerous or when, he, when we start telling him things, we suddenly become the wounders. And he has projected the wounded, the wounding, his inner wounder into us. And then we're the wounders. So we have to be limit setters in a mature way. It's going to be a big task. And I think that's enough for now. That was only 10 minutes, but that was uh, not at all disappointing and did not, uh, that lived up to my build up. That was really uh, brilliant. And though I spend more of my life uh, studying Donald Trump than I care to admit, I thought I learned a lot today. So thank you. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Gerald Post. Uh, if I can get my glasses, I can read his credentials. I know he's at George Washington, but I want to get his title right. He's a professor of psychiatry, and this is interesting to all of you, political psychology and international affairs at George Washington University. Uh, Gerald Post is actually really the father, I would say, of political psychology. Um, he has uh, participated in a lot of things, some of which are classified. Um, he's been a, helped with, this, uh, I think, the CIA developed certain profiles of certain terrorists, certain foreign leaders. I know that when the Middle East peace talks were taking place, he helped the government put together sort of a psychological profile of the protagonists to be able to facilitate the peace process. Uh, he's got a number of books. Um, the most recent one is The Mind of a Terrorist. So I'm very, very grateful that he was able to join us today and uh, introduce Dr. Post. I'm going to hand you the microphone. <laughs> I'm very struck by the duty to warn uh, title, which uh, uh, for those of you in psychiatry know comes from the Tarasov rule. And I had the occasion to address that with the head of the in, uh, Division on Psychiatry and Foreign Affairs at the APA. I'm going to talk about a somewhat different perspective to encourage you all to speak out, and I think the most remarkable aspect of what you've done, and I congratulate you, is facilitate some of us who have been under the blanket of the American Psychiatric Association's Goldwater uh, uh, Rule. Uh, I'd like to read something to you here. The unique atmosphere of this year, this is from the APA to all members, the unique atmosphere of this year's election cycle may lead some to want to psychoanalyze the candidates, but to do so would not only be unethical, it would be irresponsible. Well, that's just so, has blanketed uh, uh, our, our field, and it's, it's very inhibiting to deal with that and, and, to, uh, and to, give, uh, uh, to give voice. I thought it might be useful uh, to, uh, uh, in, in the brief time allotted, uh, to uh, talk about the inhibition that I've confronted and how difficult it is, because we need to encourage our brethren and Sisters, whatever the uh, plural for. Uh, yes. hmm? We can't hear you. Oh. Hold it straight yes, down. Right in front. Of right in front. There you Pardon go. Pardon me. Thank you. Uh, uh, at the t uh, from my George Washington base, uh, I was uh, invited uh, by the Boston Globe uh, to do a profile of Saddam Hussein, uh, and that seemed like an interesting uh, thing to do, and I. Uh, after I presented this, the next day in the New York Times, there was an article, a profile of the profile. This was in the Science uh, Times section. <laughs> Science Times section. Better? Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, I presented, uh, had some really unique material on his wounded self and its origins. Um, and. Uh, the next day in the New York Times science section that, that was, uh, there appeared a profile of the profiler mm -hmm. and, and talked about the history of profiling and the role. And that was very, very exciting. Okay, better? Yeah. 
sorry, the microphone is weak. If you consistently speak louder, Jerry. I will. If you will. And keep me on this one. And uh, I was going to please with that. And then Sam Lewis, who is the uh, president of the uh, uh, Institute of Peace, previous uh, ambassador to Israel, said this was a service of the highest order of a political psychologist, which is what I consider my core discipline to be. Just drop it under your chin right here. You'll direct it in there. Uh, there you go. Right uh, there. All right. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. All right. I'll keep it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, he called this a service of the highest order uh, 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 from a political psychologist to the national welfare. So I was feeling very good when I got a call from the uh, president of the, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the head of the Division of Psychiatry and Foreign Affairs at the APA, uh, and my back was ready to be patted for this great service I had done to the APA, uh, uh, saying, Jerry, we believe you violated the, the uh, Goldwater Rule. And I said, how is that? He said, well, I presume you haven't interviewed the, uh, Saddam Hussein, and nor do you have his permission. And I said, have you read it? And, and he said,